Hey everyone, welcome to part four of our DevOps Masterclass. And this is all about continuous integration and continuous delivery, and then maybe leading to continuous deployment as well. As you can see in the description, we have the playlist with the previous parts of the Masterclass, and depending on when this is, maybe the future parts, and the GitHub repo, which has all the artifacts around this and the previous classes, so check that out. As always, a lot of work goes into actually creating these, so a like, comment, subscribe, and share really is appreciated, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. So in this session, I really just wanna focus on that CI CD portion. So I wanna really talk about, well, what is CI CD? Why do we do it? Then actually look at some key features, and I'm gonna use GitHub. Now, there are many other solutions, but I'm really gonna focus on GitHub, and really has led to GitHub kind of the actions with some of the Azure DevOps history that obviously funneled in to create that GitHub actions. So when I think about this, and again, I'm not going to use PowerPoint this week. So we talked previously about the idea of these cycles. The whole point of DevOps and this Agile is we have these cycles of small incremental deliveries that build on each other of the value. We have the idea that, yeah, hey, look, there's the planning. And then based on that planning, we have those cycles. We have the development. Now, as part of that development, there is collaboration between the various teams, the people on there. We obviously have to do delivery. And then on that delivery, we then operate the solution. That's gathering feedback, etc. So this is this continuous cycle and with each cycle of this we're adding that incremental value these small pieces that we can then digest we can gather feedback on what's working what isn't what's being used what isn't and we drive that so we keep adding that value now when i talk about one of those key aspects and doing this constant small cycles well, that means we're constantly pushing out new code. We're constantly putting that into environments. We're constantly gathering the feedback. If we're constantly delivering bits of code, we have to constantly be testing to make sure we're not breaking things. So that continuous integration part, which is really here, that continuous integration, we have those different people using, for example, their Git technologies to have that distributed copy of the code in the repository, and then we have to bring that back together to make sure we're not breaking things. So I want to look at the concepts really around these key components. Obviously, we covered Git in detail in part two. We looked at some of the tooling in part three. Part one, we covered this in detail around boards and all the different methodologies. But I want to focus on this CICD portion today. So if I think about continuous integration, if we take that step back, if we just look at this kind of collaboration part, remember, as part of Git, we're probably going to have that trunk. The trunk is that main kind of branch. And in many companies, this might be called main, it might be called master, whatever. Now, as individuals, we're creating bits of code, but we're probably part of a team. We want to constantly be bringing that back together. Now, there's some methodologies where I bring that back together constantly in that main trunk. What's also very common is I, as my team, so there's certain commits, those point in time views of the code. As my team, we might create a feature branch. And what I want to make sure is, really daily, everyone is bringing their code back together because we want to find if there are problems. We want to find them early and often. Yes, there might be some pain when we bring each other's work back in, but we can fix it while it's still a small amount of pain, so it doesn't grow and become a much bigger problem to do. If we left it to the end of the project, it's gonna be a huge amount of work. So we think maybe eat daily, I wanna bring everyone's work back together. Now realize if I had these longing running kind of feature branches, so we call this a feature branch, now there might be other features going on, other changes, so there might be things happening in main, so then periodically, what I may actually do is kind of bring those changes into my kind of feature branch. Maybe I do a merge. Maybe I do kind of a rebase that we talked about. 
so that when I eventually bring my feature into main, it's not, again, I don't want collisions at that point. And then when my project is ready, absolutely, I will bring that in to my main branch. And that would be kind of where we use a pull request. And then we have that kind of merge in. But if we consider, hey, I'm constantly doing these small incremental changes every night we're bringing that together, I want to make sure it's not breaking. I want to make sure things still work. I want to avoid any long cycle of isolation. So we're constantly bringing in these small batches. So if there is a problem, it's going to have a smaller blast area. I'm not going to have to search for where did this thing break. If I'm doing these daily, continually integrating in, everyone in that project's changes together, it's going to be a lot easier to actually hunt and find the problem. Now realize, bringing this code in together, the quality of the testing we're going to do, is all about finding the problems, reducing the risk of when whatever we've done actually hits the reality of production. There's always still some risk. It's very hard to eliminate any risk. But the better the changes, the better the automation, the better the testing, we can really hone in and get a good confidence that, hey, we really are doing all of the good cases, we're covering all the scenarios, we're reducing the risk of when this hits the reality of production, something's going to go bang. And even when we do hit production, we're going to talk about this, there are different deployment patterns, different deployment strategies on how I roll it out to production to again gain confidence by maybe incrementally growing the amount of the user population that is actually impacted by that. So, okay, I want to do kind of continuous integration. So what is kind of that continuous integration? Well, as we kind of talked about, the whole point about this is when we do the commit, we're bringing people's code in together. Well, if I'm bringing that code in together, how do I know I haven't broken something? Now, when I bring in that code and I do that merge, I'll see if there's conflicts. <coughs> Excuse me, Git will tell me, hey, there's a conflict here, I'll have to go and fix that. But also, I may have done something in the code that actually breaks something. I've introduced a problem. So we have to test. Now, as I'm doing my development, me as the developer, I'm doing mini tests along the way. I know what my code should be doing. Ideally, I actually have test cases. I create the test cases first, and I develop against passing those test cases. That's really kind of a fantastic scenario. But I need to, as we do bring this code together, I need to make sure it works as a whole system. We've not broken something. Now, once again, at least nightly on the commit, maybe a schedule, I want to run these tests to make sure nothing has broken. So we can think about, okay, my goal here, I want to answer the question, does code still work? That fundamentally is what I want to do. So I have to think about, well, does it still build for one thing? Yes, I may have fixed the merge conflicts, but does it actually still compile? Does it still create what I want it to? And then I need to do some tests that I, I can do within the scope of kind of my pipeline to get, yeah, I, I think this is still performing as it would be expected to. So it's all about gaining that confidence. That's really what I'm after. I think, yep, yeah, we're looking good. And then I can actually go and build some kind of artifact. Now that artifact could be an image, it could be a zip file, it could be a, a Docker image to then go into containers. I'm going to have something that's the output of this continuous integration. So the point is, hey, I want to build it. I want to run some tests that I can perform. Maybe it's individual unit testings, uh, maybe .NET tests, maybe an NPM, whatever that might be and then create some artifact, and I'm going to actually push that to some kind of um, registry that I can then use further on. Now, when I talk about all of these build, these tests, these create in these artifacts, realize there's no magic. There's no just, hey, I'm running in thin air. 
fundamentally, whatever I do, be it continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, there is something running this code. Now, the naming will vary. Some things will call it an agent. Some things will call it a runner. But it's some kind of compute. There's a compute resource somewhere. Commonly, this is going to be a VM that's going to do this work. So there's going to be these various kind of steps it's going to perform that does this, that sets up the right uh, dependencies I need, that does the build, that does these maybe minimal code type tests against what I generate, that creates the artifact, that uploads the artifact to somewhere. And when I think about these agents, these runners, well, maybe it's running up in the cloud somewhere. So maybe that is like a GitHub um, hosted. Maybe it's an Azure DevOps agent, Microsoft hosted. Maybe it's running on-prem in some kind of virtual machine. The benefit there would be that sitting kind of on your network. And I can maybe get to other resources on my network. Maybe there's things I need to compile that, hey, it's some special dongle I have to have plugged in to actually make that work. It may vary, but the point is, obviously, these have to run on something. So when we talk about, hey, building and testing, we talk about the cloud, there's no magic. We always talk about that, and there is no magic thing here. It's running on something. So we want to answer these various questions. We have this continuous integration. Does it build? Um, does it still do kind of these basic things that can do some minimal testing around that? And then I want to create these various artifacts. So we think about we have this pipeline. So if we come over here, if we actually let's focus on the continuous integration first. So if I just think about, OK, continuous integration. And again, what are we integrating? We're integrating the code from the various people on that project. We're bringing it together to make sure it's still good. Now, how does this get kicked off? Well, remember, there's going to be kind of this repo. So we have the repo for our code. So for example, our Git-based repo that various people are making that changes to. Remember, we have the people doing the development work and they push up various commits. So they're making those changes. So I can think about something that happens on that repository. So there's some kind of event. Now, very commonly, that event is going to be, for example, a commit. When we talk about continuous integration, it could also be a pull request, i.e., hey, look, I'm at this stage. I want them to do a pull request into main. The first thing they're probably going to want to do is, hey, I want to see that this does build correctly. So it might trigger a CI that we can then actually look and check those things before we then agree, OK, that was successful. Maybe there's some other tests. Then we'll actually go and perform that merge. So something is going to trigger my pipeline. So there's some event that makes this happen. That could be manual as well. It could be a schedule. There are many different things I could do to actually kick this thing off. But this is going to then lead to my pipeline. So something is going to happen. I want to draw this out because I don't know how much space I'm going to take up here. So that event, we're going to trigger the start of our pipeline. Now, the first thing we're probably going to want to do is obviously we talked about it has to run somewhere. It's not running in thin air. So both things like all of the different solutions, they're going to have the concept of some kind of agent that can actually run these things. There'd be things pre-configured on those agents, but I might need other things on the agent. So I might have to actually do an install of some kind of dependency. So this might be using things like NPM, it might be using uh, NuGet, might be Maven, whatever that is, I'm pulling things into whatever is actually doing this work. So I have to set up the agent so we can do what I want it to do. Then, sure, we might actually build whatever our code is 
using maybe those dependencies that we actually had. So I want to make sure it still builds. That's obviously kind of a key point around this. Well, now I need to make sure it still works. I want to test it, and I want those tests to be automated. I do not want manual things in as part of this. So we think about testing, kind of this base does it still function. Now, I could think about, hey, this could be kind of unit type testing, maybe some basic integration, bringing things together to make sure they kind of perform as they would expect it. But the key point, I want this automated. So there's some upfront work to make those things, to create that automated um, testing, but you really need it. If I'm gonna do these continual integrations, I can't have some manual steps to do that test. Now again, this could be really anything. I could use things like NPM test, there's things like the .NET tests, uh, there's all different ways I can have this. There are special testing actions we we'll, can kind of talk about later. And the whole point here is, if I get a failure, well then it's going to go and trigger something. Now, that might go and trigger a work item. It goes and creates kind of a work item with the details. The nice thing here is, this is running as this pipeline, it has a certain ID, this can actually link to this actual execution. So I have a link to see, hey, what was the failure? I can mark it as kind of a bug. I could assign it based on maybe who did the commit this is running against. I can have all of those various things actually happening. So I can automate all of that. And again, the better the testing I have here, the stronger my confidence that this is good, which is really all what we're focused about actually doing. I can have multiple tests running, remember. I can have these running in parallel so I can get this pretty quick. And then if we're happy with that, if it passes the tests, then the next thing we're actually gonna do is probably create some kind of artifact. Now again, that could vary. This could be a package. It might create a Docker image. Obviously, a benefit of a Docker image is it contains all of the dependencies as well. But whatever we create here, the ultimate goal of this, this artifact, this collection of files, other things, I want to use this same package through the entire rest of any deployment cycles. I don't want to be rebuilding this for each environment because then, well, is my testing valid? I'm going to create this artifact, and what I'm then actually going to do is upload this. So my ultimate end result out of this is I have some registry. Now, if it's a package, it might be kind of a package manager, it could be just a regular repo. If it's a container, it could be Docker Hub or Azure Container Registry. Again, it could vary. But what I'm basically doing is I'm uploading either this kind of package or container, whatever that might be, to my registry. And then that will get used for everything else we do. That really is kind of a key point for this. Now, potentially, depending on which branch we're actually building from, so think about this for a second. If I was just building from my feature branch, it's regular continuous integration, what I might then do is go and, hey, that package, go and deploy it to my local dev team's environment that I can now work with. But if this was maybe the result of, hey, it's actually the result of a merge commit on main, well, maybe this is actually now a release. So yes, I'm gonna trigger that continuous integration because logically you might say, hey, well, we already did a build of the image of this feature branch, but how do I know it should, they should have done a merge or a rebase? I'm probably gonna, at this point, can trigger the continuous integration to make sure I'm building off of the main branch. So if this was built off of main, well at that point I might actually make this a release. So I might actually think about, hey, at this point, I've done the testing I've passed, I might optionally make release. Now when I think about making a release, 
that has various aspects to that. In my repo, I might actually create a git tag. And the whole point is I'll use that semantic versioning most of the time. So I can think about, hey, a, a major, minor, maybe a patch level. But I can actually go and tag at that point I am in main. Additionally, hey, that same idea of the release, I might actually go and apply that to whatever that package manager is. I may create that maybe a zip file with the latest images in it, grab maybe a link to the source code, a zip of the source code as well. Actually go and build that as well. So GitHub, for example, has the concept of release. I can say programmatically, hey, create a new release, upload this to the release. And now that's this packaged version that people can release. When I create one of these, it's actually gonna go and do the tagging for me. I can probably show this. Let's just quickly look at this. If I jump over for a second, just an example of what this might look like. If I actually go and do this, for example, in GitHub. So the whole point of a release, we can see here I'm looking at the code. So I'm looking at my repo. The whole thing is my repo. But over here on the right-hand side, you have, hey, look, I have a release. And if I go and look at my releases, well, we can see I have one release. And notice it has kind of this zip file. And what it also did automatically, it created these kind of compressed versions of the current view of all of the source files within there. But I can absolutely create new releases. And then it also has a tag. The tag it created as well based on me creating the release. But I can say, hey, I want to create a new release. I can choose a tag, so I might say, hey, this is version 0.2.0, .0. and I can actually tell it to, hey, look, create that new tag. So it'll actually go and create that tag in my repo at the current point on my main branch. I could give it a title, a description, and here I can actually upload binaries, so I could drag and drop, for example, zip files. But obviously I'm not gonna probably drag and drop what I would be doing is programmatically from my pipeline. So the whole point is in here, hey, I'll make a release, create the artifact, make a zip file, upload it with and make that package. So I can actually create those things there. I can do very clever things. I might look for, hey, new releases with V star, look for actually new versions of tags and trigger various parts. But the key point is in my continuous integration, I want to do these things. I want to make sure I've got the agent ready. Remember, this is ephemeral. For every job, it's going to get recreated. There's no history if I'm using a cloud-based agent or runner. So make sure I've got the things there required to maybe do my build, do my tests, build it, test it. If they all pass, hey, go and create an artifact. If it was off of main, maybe I want to go and create a new release. And I mark that because I may trigger off of a new release existing to go and do other stuff. So that could be a key point here. Now, the other big thing I probably want to do in this pipeline, and even before the pipeline, is we talk about the idea of security shifting left. And what we mean by shifting left is we don't wait till we deploy it to production and then start security scanning. I want to do the security as left as possible in the overall process. So let's just think for a minute about this commit. Well, at the point of commit, that's our code. So what can I do with just the code if I'm trying to shift security as far left? Well, I can do things like check the code. Are there security vulnerabilities I've introduced through poor coding? Uh, GitHub has things like code QL. It takes the code, it converts it to really data, and then you can run queries against that to look for various types of bad security practices in your code. Have I got secrets accidentally in my code? And again, things like GitHub will actually go and search for secrets. Um, I think they've done some tests in a public repo. If you have some kind of secret, within 15 minutes, someone has found it and is trying to use it. So we can think about, hey, as we do the commit, can the technology go and look for those secrets? And I think GitHub today partners with about 35 different 
um, types of provider like Azure and AWS and Google Cloud, it knows what their secrets look like. If it finds it, it can actually go and invalidate them for us to actually give us some protection. And also, if we think about we all these dependencies, I might open source is huge. I might be referencing other things in my program. So what is the health of my dependencies? Dependencies. So again, GitHub can build a kind of dependency tree, and then it has something called Dependabot. So Dependabot will actually go and say, hey, you're using this. This has a vulnerability. It can even create a pull request for me to say, hey, I have this confidence based on feedback from other people. Go to this version instead, and it will fix that problem. So I can think about shifting this left. And what's kind of nice is that for a public repository, the secrets, and again, I'm talking GitHub specifically here. So all of these are available for free if it's public. So the secrets is always running. Um, the check code dependencies is just a very simple go and turn that on. It doesn't cost me anything. For private, the depender bot kind of here is part of the enterprise license. Check code and secrets is part of kind of the advanced security. So for private repos, I would go and pay for those features. Also, I might have various kind of scans as part of the pipeline, absolutely. I might do various kind of checks in here, and there are actions around doing different types of security checks. But obviously, I'm creating this artifact. Now, imagine this package I'm creating here is something like a, a Docker container. Well, once again, if this was a, a Docker, I can actually have things security scanning here. If you look at Defender for Container Registries, for example, that's part of Azure, as I upload new images, it actually would take that, bring it down, and using Qualys, scan it for vulnerabilities. And obviously, vulnerabilities change over time. So if it's actually been actively pulled within the last 30 days, it will kind of scan it again. So it's making sure it's healthy, it's not got vulnerabilities, and then obviously vulnerabilities change, so it keeps kind of doing that scanning. But that's the point of our continuous integration. Bring the code together, make sure it still works, it does what you want, and again, we're shifting left that security so we're not just finding the problems all the way at the end. That would kind of be a, a bad day for most of us. So that's continuous integration. Great. Then I think about continuous delivery. So this was about testing the code and creating something at the end of that. Well, then we're going to lead in and we'll say, right, continuous delivery. That's a bit bigger. OK. Now, continuous delivery, just like continuous integration, is going to trigger off of something. So once again, I'm going to have kind of a pipeline. And what's very common here is off of whatever that we created some artifact and we stored it. So I'm going to think about this is going to be the trigger for my next pipeline. Now that could be, hey, yeah, look, there's a new artifact. Or it could actually be, hey, someone created a new release. Because again, we could use that kind of release mechanism. So we're going to have something to trigger this thing actually running. Now let's just think for a second. If it was that feature branch for a local team, they might have their own little local environment. They might have their own little mini CD pipeline that, hey, we created this artifact that's just kind of local. It will put it in their environment, and that's kind of it. But if it's on this main branch, that's obviously got a much bigger, far-reaching implication of that. There's continuous delivery. So this pipeline, I'm going to kind of draw this out here. What we're really focused on is now we want to get better confidence about this new artifact, this new version of the code, whatever that might be. 
we are not just gonna go and put that straight into production. We wanna build confidence, remember, really, because there's limited, there's certain testing we can do here, sure, but it's very maybe kind of isolated because we're not pushing it to a real environment. We can maybe just do some very basic kind of, uh, oh, what is this doing? Is it doing these basic things? I need to now see it as this holistic part of the big solution to make sure it's performing as we expect. And there's different types of test. So I'm gonna run this through different environments to gain confidence. So I might think about when I have a test environment. I might have, for example, uh, a staging environment or a QA. And then I have kind of prod. There might be others. So when I think continuous delivery, continuous delivery is this. Continuous delivery is making sure I have a production ready artifact, but it's not actually deploying it to production. Continuous deployment is taking it to production. But obviously continuous deployment essentially requires continuous delivery. I can't continually deploy to production unless I have production ready code. Continuous delivery depends on continuous integration to be creating the artifact that I'm actually gonna go and push to production. So they build on each other. And continuous deployment is obviously that automated push. Now I say automated push, there can still be checks actually within there. So they all build, I have this constant things. Now, we have the separate environments. The whole point is, I want to be able to do different tests and gain that additional confidence. So there are going to be gates. And we're going to talk a lot more about these. But I'm going to have gates between these. These are not just going to go and pass. I'm gonna do various things to actually check. The whole point of this is, hey, I want these different environments, so I, if, I, if it's wrong here and breaks, I've not really affected many things. Here, there might be other teams and other things going on, but I've still not affected production. This, okay, that's a sad day. If I break things there, that's kind of a bad thing. So I think about deploying to different places. And again, remember, if it was like a feature branch and I'm testing, it would just be to my local app team. If it's on the main branch, that's when I think about pushing it through all of these different things. So now, my point is to take the validated code and push it through these environments. Now, the first thing, if I think about any of these stages, it obviously is an environment. So that environment, has to be built. Now, it may already exist. This could be something in Azure or AWS, it could be on premises. But I, I have to make sure at all of these stages, my environment is built. Now, I'm writing build, it may not be building it, it may be validating it meets my expected configuration. Now, how do I do that? How do I build the environment? I want to use infrastructure as code. The whole point of infrastructure as code is it's declarative. I'm telling it what I want the environment to look like. Because it's as code, I can use version control for this. So whatever technology I use, be it an Azure Resource Manager or Terraform or Bicep, whatever that is, it's code. So this same definition that I'm using here will actually go and get committed into my repository, which is actually a useful thing. So if I then change my definition of the infrastructure, well, it will go and trigger things. Now I might tag it as infrastructure as code. If it's infrastructure as code, I don't need to do a rebuild here, but I would re-kick off the continuous delivery because I'm changing the size, the shape of my production environment. So I'd want to kind of understand that. And a really important thing about all of these, 
all of these different environments I, I might have through here, all environments production consistent. That is critical. There is no point in having testing completely different from production. It's got debuggers on it, and it's got all these other things, as just staging. Is my test still valid? I might have missed a dependency, but it works in test and staging because they're not like production. Is production consistent? It doesn't have to be the same size, the same scale, but I want it consistent with production to make sure the tests that I'm doing are valid. I could also think about things like databases. Hey, I, I might have kind of a database. So for my database is whatever the schema is, uh, configuration, again, those things would be as code. They're checked in, they might trigger, if I change the database schema, it would go and recreate environments. So it's critical that all these environment builds are built off infrastructure as code. And became, because it's declarative, it's item potent. What that means is I'm telling it what I want it to look like, and I can just apply the template. If the environment already matches what I want it to look like, nothing happens. But if it doesn't, it will make it so. Or at minimum, I could detect the drift so I could go and do something. Now, that infrastructure's code, that declarative technology, could also be used inside, for example, a VM. There's things like Chef and Puppet and PowerShell DSC. Again, I want to make sure everything is configured how I want it. Everything is version controlled, it's as code in the repo that will actually go and drive through and make sure those things are done the right way. If it's Kubernetes, uh, I have my YAML file, maybe it's Helm charts to bring multiple YAML files together as a complete set. That's declarative. I want it to look this way. And the key part again here is I want that production consistent. And then remember, we're then going to think about, remember we had that artifact in the registry. We are going to go and actually do our deploy the package, the code, whatever that is. And again, it's the same version. I don't want variation. If I rebuild it for prod, what validation has that done? So I think about this package is same across all environments. I'm not rebuilding it once. I've created this artifact, be it release off of main, whatever. Once I kick off this continual, continuous delivery, maybe continuous deployment, I don't do anything else. I have that same package or container from like Docker Hub, whatever that might be, but I've got that from the registry. I have consistent dependencies. Dependencies. I forget how to spell when I write on a whiteboard. I think the brain has trouble doing two things at once. So these different environments, I'm consistent between them. There's no variation, be it application deployment, image deployment, API deployment. I'm using um, NPM, NuGet, uh, Maven. I can have my own package managers for my company to make sure the version hasn't changed. If maybe there's multiple days between this, these dependencies, they must be same version. So I might think about having my own kind of private package manager. where I bring in a particular version, and that's what I go and build these from. So I know, hey, there's not been some variation, something has a mess with it, which will then invalidate my testing. So it's super important to actually go and have that. And then, well, I'm, I'm actually gonna do the testing. Now, testing here's a little bit off, but maybe I like smoke testing. There might be validation tests and other things going on here but I obviously have to then actually go and test these things, that's critical. So when I think about these kind of tests, all of this testing, what am I testing?
there's multiple things I care about. So obviously functionality. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Do all the components fit together? And again, this is all automated. And I can automate really, and even GUI interactions, I can automate today. So there's a massive things I can do about all of that. There's different methods, different platforms, but I can really automate all of those things. I think about testing my security. Now again, we've shifted left, but I still might run various checks at these different environments to make sure I'm not seeing vulnerabilities. I can have scanning tools in these environments. I can check various things, which will bring me to compliance. Have I broken any compliance? Now, depending on where I'm doing this through, for example, in Azure, I could use something like Azure Policy. So that would actually let me go and check, hey, am I still within the requirements of this environment, the guardrails, I'm still behaving within those. I might check performance. Now, performance is a tricky one because remember, these are production consistent, not production equal. I'm not so much testing, does it meet this number if it's not, um, and it's very hard to get those same kind of metrics. But I have a number of what I've seen in the past for my tests. I have those benchmarks. So what I might look for here is I'm looking for a variance. So I put in this new version of code, maybe a new database schema, I've done something. And maybe here, if I saw a variance of maybe greater than 2%, maybe that's a fail. So if that's a fail, so we would stop wherever we are, we would go and create kind of that work item idea. And we go back to the drawing board to look at what, what is going on. What has actually caused that to happen? So we're having these things, the whole point of this pipeline is to gain confidence. And the only way we can get true confidence is to make sure it's consistent, make sure the environments are consistent, they don't have different things installed, make sure it's the same package, and I wanna do really good tests that hit all of those things, the functionality, the security, compliance, performance. Now again, at this point here, and again, when we talk about gates, and I'm gonna go into more detail, here there might be some user. There might actually be users do need to come in try it out, make sure it does what they expect, and then it's allowed to proceed. So there may actually be user type things there, but I wanna try and minimize it as much as possible. And then you get to production. Now, I kinda of just drew it, hey, check, deploy, smoke test. The reality is, for most companies, when I start to think about this production, uh, it's probably pretty unlikely I'm just gonna deploy that in one go. So I can really think about production rollout. And what this is really gonna boil down to is I have different deployment patterns, um, strategies, different ways I actually think about pushing these out. And I can think about, in reality, it's probably not just this one kind of blob. What I'm more likely to do is have some kind of, within prod, so this is all kind of prod, but actually I probably have these kind of mini segments. So it's kind of this segment one, two, three, four, whatever that might be. Now the actual makeup of those segments will vary. I would say don't over engineer. I could go way overboard, make it so complex, it needs to match and bring value uh, to what I'm trying to do. It's all about that confidence and gaining even more confidence because sometimes all the testing in the world really doesn't match production and how it's really used in production. Now I could think about in place upgrade. I.e. I'm just deploying this thing. Now there may be technologies like deployment slots that enable me to kind of warm up the code and then switch it over by IP changes, whatever, that may help. But fundamentally what I get with in-place upgrades is it's super simple. I'm basically just putting the new code in production, 
but I may actually have some kind of downtime. And it really is kind of this big bang approach. Everyone's going to get in this at once. Now, if I use things like deployment slots, I can roll back. I could switch it back if it doesn't work, so I get some benefit there. But it essentially is just all switching over at the same time. And that, that's kind of a scary concept for most things. So then we can think about, well, there's progressive. And when we say progressive, what we really kind of mean are rings. So I have different segments of the population. That's a key point of the rings. It's different people or systems are in a certain ring. It might be like a, a pilot ring, a pilot two ring, early adopters, general population one, general population two, general population three. So the point is it goes through the different rings that are these specific parts of the population of this software. And so I gain more confidence. The first slice will be very small. Second slice, um, a different part of the population, maybe use different parts of the functionality. But I'm gaining confidence as those specific parts of the population get the code. So the benefit here is I have great control. Fantastic control of this. And sometimes it might be feature flags that I'm turning on or off for different parts of the population to see the new functionality. Again, feature flags is something I've not really talked about, but they can be really super useful. Because if you think about, maybe I do use trunk-based development, so I'm constantly actually merging, committing to main, but my code's not ready. So I can use feature flags to basically disable the code, but still bringing it together until it's actually ready. So when I think about some of these deployment strategies, well, maybe I enable it for these different segments through turning on those feature flags. That can be something I can do. So this gives me great control, but it can be quite complex, and it may take time. That may not be a bad thing, but obviously as I go through different segments, it takes more time to actually deploy those things out. The next thing we can actually do is Canary. Now, Canary actually looks a lot like Progressive, but this is really just a percentage of the population. So, hey, I get 5%, then 15%, then 50%, then 100%. So there's no targeting to it. It's just, hey, I maybe have weighting. So like I could have a load balancer, for example, and that load balancer initially maybe directs 5% to some area, and then 25% to the new code, then 50. So I could actually trigger it using those. So I'm just exposing it to a gradually bigger portion. So now I'm not worrying about specific people. It's just, hey, a certain weighting goes somewhere. So it's a pretty good control. It's simpler than this. But it's not simple. And I still have that, hey, it still takes time. And there is still an element of the complexity. There's still things I have to do there. And then we have things like blue-green. Doesn't have to be blue and green. Really, it's the idea I have two environments. And when I have the new version, I deploy it to the other environment that's not currently production. And again, here I might combine this with these things to actually start pulling portions of the population over, and then eventually I, I kind of flip it. And now blue, which was prod, is now empty and ready for the next staging. So this is simpler in a lot of ways. The downside is resource use. Because if you think about it, if I have to have a whole separate environment, depending on how I'm actually switching these, I might have a whole environment not doing very much. Now, in the cloud, where it's consumption-based, maybe that is not a big deal. Because I can essentially create the other environment only when I need it. It's not just sitting there idle all the time. So that consumption nature of the cloud may absolutely offset that to a certain degree. But I'm going to point is, I can not just think about, hey, prod, I may actually break this down into different methodologies to get that 
confidence. I'm gonna keep using the word confidence. It's all about getting better confidence that this code I'm putting in is not gonna destroy my world, which is production. So I wanna make sure, hey, I'm feeling pretty good on this. Now obviously, if at any point in all of this, if I was hitting points here of failures, it stops, it rolls back, and I restart whatever failed and go back. It could be it wasn't code, remember, I might trigger this pipeline because I had a new infrastructure as code or a new database schema. It would still be a commit, triggered this, if it doesn't work, I roll it back. In production, if one of these slices maybe starts having a whole bunch of work items, because again, I can have gates in all of these as well. So these can all have gates. Maybe it's the number of work items raised against that particular slice. If I've got more than 10 tickets raised, let's stop. Let's work out what's happening, and then I'll let this actually go and carry on. So any problems? Hey, let's stop. Let's make sure we fix it before we go, we don't just ignore it. We do these for a reason, to gain confidence before we move this on. But again, where is our pain? If something's not hurting us, maybe we don't need to actually fix this. So let's actually now do this thing. Um, let's actually talk about doing this with various tools available. And I'm gonna focus on GitHub. But remember, GitHub kind of grew from Azure DevOps. So I'm gonna start with looking at Azure DevOps and then grow this into thinking about what we actually have today with GitHub Actions. But there are others. Jenkins, for example, is super, super popular. GitLab has solutions. There are lots of solutions that have the idea of enabling all of this to be a reality. I'm just more familiar with kind of the GitHub and the Azure DevOps, so that's what I'm gonna show. I'm not saying that's what you should use. It's just that's what I am familiar with, so that's what I'm gonna demonstrate. You use whatever part works best for you and kind of your company and what you're used to. Realize all of this is really based around, you saw that in the pictures, there's some event. There's some event, some event triggers the continuous integration, a commit, a pull request. Some event triggers the pipeline, new artifact, new release. So there's some event that makes stuff happen. That's really what this all boils down to. So we have event, do stuff. And then everything else is about, well, how do we do stuff? And that's what we're gonna focus on first. So how does Azure DevOps do stuff? And I can think about with Azure DevOps, and again, you, you might be saying, oh, I don't use Azure DevOps. Totally get it, but it's actually quite useful to understand where it's come from, to understand where GitHub Actions is today. So you have pipelines. Now that was kind of a major segment of technology. And then what you had under pipelines was build pipelines, and then you had release pipelines. And these were GUIs. So build was obviously continuous integration. This was obviously continuous delivery, continuous deployment. And these are GUI based, or at least they, they were kind of GUI based. So let's just quickly look at this, just a couple of minutes to understand where we're coming from. So if I jump back over for a second, so let's go back over to here. We look at my DevOps. I'm actually gonna switch orgs for a second to my Savile Tech DevOps, because I've got an old one laying around. So if I go to my pipelines over here, now it's called pipelines here. It's pipelines, pipelines. It's because it used to be called builds. So it was pipelines, builds, but they've renamed it to pipelines, and we'll see why. And then I also have releases, i.e. CD. So if I look at ye old days, and look at my pipelines, I'll select this one and we'll edit it. It's a GUI. Now I can see it's basically, I've got some job, I've got an agent job one, that runs on an agent, so it's running on something, again it can't run on thin air, and then there was just steps. And I could add new steps to this. There was this set of steps I could take, and these are actually tasks within the step, that I could drag over into the things I need to do. 
So I can see, hey, install Bower, run Bower, use .NET Core, restore, do some tests, publish the test results, publish, um, publish the artifact. So this was the CI. And you can see, I can, I can see the complete CI pattern here. Hey, install the stuff I need to actually do the build, do the build, do the tests, and then publish it, create the artifact. So that was the idea. Graphically, I could kind of drag and drop these various things. Then I had a release. Now remember, what's the point of a release? The point of the release is to get it into environments. So I triggered off of an artifact, and I could have this automatically, this continuous deployment. Hey, an artifact's created, run this. In this case, this was kind of this progressive ring-based deployment. And what I could actually do is I could have pre-deployment conditions and post-deployment conditions. So I could say, hey, for ring one, I could turn on approvals, and I could also turn on gates. So I could think about, hey, a deployment gate could be check for policy compliance, call a function, call a REST API, et cetera, et cetera. So it was this GUI-based thing to actually create those. So that was kind of the key point. So two separate things, GUIs. The challenge with that is it wasn't code. So it wasn't really living in my repo as a way I could easily version control and leverage that. So what they've now actually moved to is YAML for pipelines. That's why it's been renamed. So we don't really call it build anymore. I can still do the GUI. This is still there. I can still kind of do the classic. Kind of the name they always give things that they say are not very good. Everything's classic, which is really not very good anymore. Except for music. <laughs> but now it's these YAML-based pipelines. And it supports multi-stage. So we have multi-stage now. And if you think about multi-stage, what does that mean? We use stages for CD. So I can use this for CI and CD now. So that's really kind of the huge shift. It's code. It's in our repo. I can version it. It's a bit of a higher learning curve because it's now YAML, but it's code, it's version control. I can actually use that for various things. Now, there's a whole marketplace around these. There's a whole set of starter templates. If I go and look at the Azure DevOps marketplace for a second, these are a whole bunch of extensions, but I can see there's things about artifacts, boards, but pipelines. There's all these things, there's massive numbers of these that can plug into the pipelines. These are all like bits of YAML I can leverage and put into my YAML-based pipeline. And this is all going to start to look more familiar, especially when we start looking actually at GitHub Actions, which again has really grown from here. So the point is now, if I go back to my pipelines, and we'll just go new pipeline, by default, it's going to use YAML. Now, notice it's asking me, where's my code? It doesn't have to be in Azure repos. It could be GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, some other Git, uh, Bitbucket. There's still the classic editor down here. So if I want to use, without YAML, I want to use the GUI, I can use classic editor, and it's going to have its own little interface. Again, it can still trigger off different sources, and then there's a whole bunch of template libraries I can use. But if we just say, hey, where's my code? Repos, use this repo. It's going to give me a whole bunch of starter pipelines. It's actually going to go and populate all of those core things I need based on the type of project. So it's going to give me this great starting point, or I can just have a really, really basic one. So what I'm, I'm going to kind of do is talk through the basic structure. So I'm going to change, actually, my organization again. And we'll go to our video planning, go to our pipelines. So I've got this super, super basic pipeline. And look at this, it's my video planning. So this is my say hello. And what we can kind of see here, there's a certain structure to this. So firstly, obviously, there's a name. So when I create a new one, I can specify the name. 
and I can put it in a folder. So it's under the repo, but I, I created a folder called pipelines and I put it there. So it has a name, well, and it has a trigger. So my trigger is off of the main branch. So I can think about, okay, my YAML pipeline, I have a name, my something somewhere dot YAML. I'm gonna have a trigger, something that tells this to run. Now again, I could manually run this. There are many different types of triggers I can do. I can specify a pool. So the pool are the agents I'm going to use, and I'll talk more about this. I can optionally have stages, but I don't have to. But again, if it was continuous deployment, continuous delivery, I'm going to have stages to use those different things with different controls around that. My stages are then going to be made up of jobs. And my jobs, well, they're essentially going to could have their own pool. So obviously I had a pool here, but these could optionally use a different pool, depending on maybe I'm building to something else. And then that's made up of steps, and those steps call tasks. So that's the fundamental structure of what we're doing. So again, we jump back over to this for a second. We can see that here. So if we go and look, I can see, okay, well, I'm using a certain pool and I'm using a Linux pool. I can see I have a stage A, which has a job. It has a name. First job is A1. It's made up of some steps and this is just echo hello world and I have a display name. Now, also, you can see I have a depends on. So here you can see, hey, look, I've got this depends on nothing. So normally there's kind of this implicit depends on the previous stage. So the stages will run in order. But here I'm saying, hey, it doesn't depend on anything. So now this stage B will run in parallel with stage A. And then it's got its own jobs. Stage C, well, it, I'm actually saying, hey, it depends on A and B. So A and B, which run in parallel, have to finish first and then it will run this job. And we can see this time it's actually using this thing called an environment. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. And it has its own steps. And then stage D, hey, it then just runs in another environment and it's doing some stuff. So we're basically just having these various things within here. So we've got those things I can actually execute. So if I look at that structure for a second, there were a few extra things I kind of added into this. So optionally, we could have kind of this depends on. So that was all about well, these things have to finish in a certain way. We also saw, well, I could actually have this pool in here as well. It could use a different pool in there. And then we also saw this idea of kind of an environment that I could leverage. So these different aspects. So stages will run sequentially unless I do something different. Environments, so that was kind of interesting. What was the environment all about? So if I'm thinking multi-stage, remember stages, this is what essentially enables this part here, this enables continuous delivery, continuous deployment. I have to be able to have those different stages to be able to function. Well, they probably want to run to different environments, QA, test, UAT, production. So we have this concept of the environment. And what an environment actually does for us is a number of different things. So environments have the idea of different security. Who can actually interact with that environment? I can think about, it can actually have resources. It can have like VMs and Kubernetes clusters, but even if it doesn't, it's still actually a useful construct. I can have approvals. I can have uh, various types of gate, i.e. checks. 
I can also with this have is I can track what's happened to that environment. And to use this, I need deployment jobs. So there's different types of job. To use an environment, I need a deployment job. Now there's a big shift here. If you remember the original release, those pre and post approvals were part of the pipeline itself. Which actually doesn't make that much sense. It's better to have the environment having the conditions and not relying on the person creating the pipeline to do the right checks. So we move the conditions to the environment. And this is important because GitHub's going to do the same thing. So we have these environments that I can use. And then any of these things I set, that's going to apply to whatever. I can lock down what, um, for example, what branch can deploy to it. So if we go back for a second, I can actually go over here and you can see environments. Now within that environment, I create two, QA and test. If I look at QA, and I go to these dots at the top over here, I can edit, but also there's security and there's approvals. So on the approvals, if I hit add, and again, I'm at the top here, this little button, or I can add people to approve, I can limit it to certain branches, I can limit it to hours, um, evaluate the artifact to make sure I'm adhering to certain policies, I can put certain locks, invoke a function, a REST API, query Azure Monitor, use it based on a required template, it has to be in the pipeline. Huge numbers of checks I can use. So then when the pipeline actually wants to use the environment, I'm not having to specify any checks here, but it will essentially make it so. To use test, any checks I have on test will have to get passed. And also the nice thing is if we just manually run this. So if we just run this, it's going to kick off the run. So notice even though it's YAML, notice it still gives me a graphical view of the execution. And remember I said these would run in parallel because the depends on was nothing. So it's waiting for an agent to be available. And then these are going to kind of start in parallel. I can expand them out and see the individual jobs then C depended on A and B, and then implicitly D is going to depend on C. So I can see B is finished already. I can actually see it, oh, it wrote out a script, although it is hel another hello from here. I could see A, a is kind of checked out. So that had an option to check out the code. It said hello. Now what will happen is C will start, and again, each of these stages can run in its own environment. So this is running a different environment. So I'm going to get kind of a different agent to go and run this. So it has to get an agent for this. We wait for both of those to complete. But I get huge, great information on all of these different things. And in the environments, I can see the last change that impacted them. So I can see, oh, okay, thanks, actually running on QA right now. So I can see the last activity. So even if I don't have any resources in it from an Azure DevOps perspective, it's still really useful for me to see well, what has happened to these environments. I can see the actual jobs that have recently run against them. So I can see that is now actually finished. So there we go. So it ran all of those different things. So that's why environments are really super useful. I don't have to worry about the checks in the job itself. It's actually just going to kind of use those. Okay. So I've kind of mentioned the agents and it's running on the agents. So all of these times where I've got the word pool, well, it's running on an agent. So I can actually think about, hey, all of these things in Azure DevOps language are agents. These can be Microsoft hosted. And if they're Microsoft hosted, they can be Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Again, I can still install things, but they are ephemeral. They're going to get created, then they get deleted. Now, things in the same stage can use the files from each other. But outside of that, 
Uh, it's deleted, it's recreated at the same of every single go. I can also have self-hosted. So with self-hosted is I install the software, but now it's running in maybe my environment. So the benefit here could be my internal resources. Maybe I have something it needs to be able to access. Maybe it's deploying to something on-prem that a cloud hosted agent wouldn't be able to get to. It can also be long lived. It doesn't have to be, but it, it can actually live a long time and have cons maybe caching between it, persistent files, so maybe it's a bit quicker as well. There are certain timeouts how long these things uh, can run for, but again, I can actually set these at a kind of a job level if I want to and use different sets of agents. So that's where we've kind of come from with Azure DevOps. And then we've kind of got to that YAML point. If you want to play with Azure DevOps, there's actually a nice little DevOps generator you can go to. So the DevOps generator site, I'll just kind of show it quick. What it lets you do is basically specify a, a starter and it will create your entire repository, your entire project for you with a whole bunch of pre-canned content and it lets you play around with it. So here I could, I would just kind of sign in and then actually let me go and pick the scenario. So this, the link to that is below in the actual description for the video. So GitHub Actions, uh, let's kind of dive into that. Now there's gonna be a lot of familiar with the Azure DevOps pipelines, the new YAML based one, because again, the way this kind of came to life was, well, they kind of took a fork of that code and then, I mean, they changed a lot of things, but there is a lot of familiarity with it. So if you understand that, what I'm gonna talk about with GitHub will make a lot of sense. So if I think GitHub, so that was Azure DevOps, let's kind of keep the flow going. So GitHub, I really should use consistent colors. So we'll say GitHub. And what we're really talking about here is GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions is all built around the idea that there's some event, which we're familiar with, and that event is gonna trigger a workflow. So that's gonna trigger a workflow. Now, that workflow is going to have some kind of name.yaml. And it's going to get stored in the dot github slash workflows. Yep. So it has to live there of your repository. So it lives in the repository. In GitHub, the repository is, is kind of everything. Most things live in the repository. So I can call it anything I want, but it's going to live in that .github slash workflows folder of my repository. So it's going to trigger on something, maybe a commit, a pull request, we're going to talk more about that. It's made up of jobs. And those jobs run on something. So there's kind of a runs on some runner, it's called. I can optionally use environments, which is gonna seem very, very familiar, as I talked about when we, when we actually go and talk about kind of Azure DevOps. I can think about it might need certain things. So needs means some other job ran first. So it's how I do kind of dependencies. So I can say it needs something else to have run first. Then I can have it jobs made up of steps. And those steps are really made up of actions. And those actions typically use something. They use a certain GitHub action. So this is kind of the structure we have. Now, a key point of this is this event, and this is very, very different when I compare this to Azure DevOps. This can essentially, these events can be anything. It is not just CI/CD. It absolutely is CI/CD as well. 
I can absolutely do things based on a commit, on a pull request, on a new release or artifact. Absolutely, I can do those things, sure. Um, I can do it on manual, and I can manually trigger this thing. I could do it on a schedule, but I could do it on a new comment, a new collaboration. I could do it on someone new has joined it. I could do it on a new discussion point. I can essentially create these workflows to automate anything. If I go and look at the documentation, I can look at all the events that can trigger workflows. And it's huge. There are so many different types of things that can actually trigger workflows in here. It's not some small little list. It's this massive different set of things that I can actually trigger for this. So if you kind of think about anything happening in GitHub, I might want to have some automated process for, I probably can. I can automate really anything. I, want, I can even have a webhook to trigger these things. So if you think about that structure for a second, let's jump over to here. So again, I just go in my, I'm in my repo. I can go over here to actions. And again, with actions, if I just say I want to create a new workflow, it will actually go and look at my repository. It will look at the type of code in my repo and say, hey, why don't you start with this? So if I had like, for example, Node.js, it would give me things about building a Node.js. Uh, application. Here it's got options, hey, I could deploy a Node.js. If I looked at this quickly, what we'll see is my on, i.e. my trigger, is on a release of anything created. So there's all these various things available to me. Now I'm going to start with a basic hello. And what we can see here really is very, very simple. I gave it a name. I'm triggering on workflow dispatch, I, I'm manually running it. I have a section of jobs. This job is just called build. I'm running on Ubuntu latest. And then I have a set of steps, which are really not very interesting. Now my first step uses actions slash checkout version two. So a key point there is, okay, there might be different versions, there's references, and I'll talk more about the actions in a second. Then I've got some that are just using a run. I'm just running a script, a echo hello world. I could also have a multi-line script down here. But it's really just made up. So this looks super, super familiar of what we just did. And I could absolutely run that. If I select that for a second, so I can actually go and view runs rather than manually running it, which I absolutely could. Um, just go to my view runs. These are all the things that have kind of triggered. Notice I could do a run workflow here. Just run that off of, I could select a branch. But here are all the runs of this one. I can see oh, there's the build step. I can see all of those individual steps. So that's checking out the code of the repo. If I ever want to use the code, I have to actually do an action to get the code first into my member. This is an agent. This is a runner that's ephemeral, it's created. So if I want to be able to use the code in the repo, well, I have to do a checkout and get the code into that runner. And then it's running the various things. I can see all the output. When it's actually running kind of live, if I jump back for a second, it's going to finish by now anyway, so there it is. But when it's actually running, Let's actually rerun the job. Once it's actually running in here, you get kind of this live log to see what is actually going on. So it's, hey, it's like setting up the job. So I get this live log of everything that's happening actually during that execution. So there's huge amount of detail available to actually go back and troubleshoot and everything else. So that's kind of a really simple kind of action there. Now I mentioned before it has to run on something. 
so when we think about, okay, this runs on, that runs on is essentially the runners for our environment. So just like Azure DevOps, there's a whole different set of those. So I can think, okay, there's GitHub hosted. And once again, it's Windows, Linux, Mac OS. And once again, I can do self-hosted. The OSs are the same that, that are supported on that self-hosted model. And again, I have that same idea, hey, I can access internal stuff. Once again, I have the idea that they can be, um, sorry, they can be long lived if I want them. Don't have to be, but they can be long lived if I want them to be. And just in case you're wondering about the actual structure of well, how does that really work? Again, these are called runners. So these are the runners, they're not called agents. If I'm running that on premises, for example, so maybe it's a VM, and I install the GitHub runner in there, so the thing about GitHub is up here, I'm not opening up any firewall ports. And again, ADO works exactly the same way. If I have my kind of firewall in my environment, it's actually, it makes an outbound connection to GitHub. So the connection is, that way, 443. I'm not opening anything up inbound from the internet. That's the connectivity it's actually going to use um, for that. And again, they're ephemeral. They're wiped every time. Um, if we look at what ones are available to us, so this talks about uh, exactly the cloud hosted running. So that's the GitHub hosted runners here. And we can see the labels we can use. So I've got things like, hey, Windows Server 2022, Windows Latest, Ubuntu Latest, Mac OS, Mac OS Latest. So they're the versions of runners um, I can actually leverage. And exactly like Azure DevOps, there's common software installed on them. But realize if I need extra software, I'd have to install it as part of the pipeline. There's other things I need for continuous integration to build, I would have to install those. Now, if I actually want to have self-hosted runners, it's part of the settings of my repository, or I can have kind of org ones as well. But I would kind of go down here to actions, and then we have runners under the actions category. And that's where I could go and actually go and add a runner. And then I can have secure about who can use them and all those various good fun things. There are timing limits. So there's certain amount of times execution time. So it's up to six hours of execution time. Um, each workflow run is 72 hours. There's certain usage policies for these. Again, you get a certain amount of free minutes, for example, for um, the public repos, even private, you get a certain amount of free as well. But you can go and look through this again, the links in the description below to find out all about the billing aspects and using these various things. So we, we have all of that available there. Now, I talked about these actions. An action is fundamentally some reusable piece of code. So when I'm saying these actions and I'm using these things, well, what is it? And you notice there was a kind of a weird format with action slash the name, hat, whatever. So my actions themselves are going to be the owner. So like the, the owner of the repo. So John the Brit, for example, or Savile Tech, slash the repo name, and then a reference. So for example, it could be the version. And these could be JavaScript, so I can write them in JavaScript, or they can actually be a container. So there's different types of actions I can use there. 
Now, I can build my own. A, a huge amount of these available are created by the community, and I can leverage those. I can publish them to a marketplace. Now, there's a huge amount of these provided by GitHub. So there's kind of GitHub provided. Remember, these are units of functionality. There are ones available in public repositories. I cannot use one in someone else's private repo. Now, I can use a private one in the repo of the workflow, i.e. if I have my own action in my private repo in the same repo as the workflow, I can use that. Otherwise, I can't. Also, if it's container-based, I could use it from Docker Hub. Again, public access. You have to basically think the agent is running in the context of the repo. It has to be able to get to it. And I can't get to anything other than public. And essentially, I can publish them to the marketplace. So we can actually go and kind of look. That's optional. I don't have to. But we can go and look at the marketplace. So if we go and look, there's huge numbers. There are currently actions, so look at actions, uh, 9,737. Now, one of the things I can do is I can turn on verified creator. This is not GitHub verifying the uh, actual action itself. They are verifying the creator of the app, of the, the person who created it. So, for example, Azure, for example. So, I could go and search for Azure. So, I can see there are 38 verified creators from Azure itself. So I can see that Azure SQL deploy, Azure pipelines, and this is how I can go and create things and add them into mine. Maybe I'm worried about release management. So I could search for a release. And actually, let me turn off that for a second. So I see all these different things that I could do about creating releases. People have created actions about this. And package management. I can go and find something. And if I just looked at, I don't know. And notice there's categories of continuous integration. There's ones about deployment. There's ones about testing. So I can go and look at any of these things. I'll just click any of them. It shows me a sample of the YAML to use this. Notice the format. So, okay, it's using the actions kind of owner. This one GitHub provided the checkout repo, and I'm using the V1. And then, if we think about, well, now this is the owner, he created this, and then the repo, and then it's just the master. So that's the reference to it. The master branch is kind of that reference there. So that's how I can go and use them. So I go and search for what I'm trying to do. And it's going to give me the YAML that I can then leverage in mine. So th this is the process. I would go and find the various actions. Now, if I was actually going through and let's say, so let's go to my environment workflow. I'm going to edit. So I can actually edit it in here. Now, this is just code again, remember. So it could be edit this in VS Code and then synchronize it up. Notice I can search the marketplace from here. I could just do Azure AKS. Oh, deploy it to Kubernetes cluster. Oh, great. I could click that. And then within this editing, it's showing me the code that I would actually need to do. So it's got a uses. OK, so the owner is Azure. OK, repo, Kubernetes deploy. And there's the reference of v1.3. So it's very easy to take that and then just cut and paste and put that. It's even got an option to copy it to my clipboard, you can see there, super easy. And then paste that and start using that in my code. So testing, anything I'm using is nothing really more complicated than just actions I'm actually going to go and use, but it's super nicely integrated. Now, one other thing before I move on to the next demo. If we think CD, this is where GitHub Actions was weak. It was great for continuous integration. It wasn't very good for continuous delivery, continuous deployment, because it didn't have the concept of stages. What well, it does. Now, we have these concept 
of kind of these these jobs that can have needs so it can have relationships to other jobs that have run but now we have this concept of environments and just like the azure devops we can have things now it's not at the same level so it's depending on my functionality requirements it may or may not meet my needs but once again what i can have here are reviewers Now today it's only one of them has to approve it. I can't select multiple people. I can have wait timers. I can have branch protection, so only accept code from this branch. For example, if it was prod, maybe I only accept it from main. I can have environment level secrets. So there's in repo level secrets and environment level secrets. And then I can use a certain environment. Now there are ways to expand that. Um, there's also the ability, for example, there's an API, there's an approval API that I could hook into so third parties could expand this. I think GitHub are working on adding more things to this. But let's actually go and take a look at environments. So before I go and look at this code, if I look at my settings, for my repo, I have environments. Now I created three, test, prod, and QA. And on prod, you can see I've got a couple of reviewers, so someone has to review it. I don't have a wait timer, but I only accept code from the main branch. And I've also defined an environmental secret called greeting. Now, that same environment variable, I also configured in test, see greeting here as well. And I defined it, as you're gonna guess, in QA. And I have a wait timer of one minute for QA. And also at the repo itself, I have greeting. So greeting in four different places. So I want to kind of show a couple of different things at once. So I have those environments. I have an environment workflow that if we look at this, what I'm doing is nothing fancy, but essentially I have a push or pull request from main will trigger this. And I can manually run it as well. And then what I have are different jobs. So I have job one runs on Ubuntu latest in environment test. And all I'm doing is writing out a greeting, but I'm taking out of secrets greeting. Now, because it's environment test, it should be getting the greeting of test. Now, one of the funny things what GitHub does is if I try and output secrets.greeting in the log, it will just put three asterisks. It will hide it for my own protection. And what I did is I actually set it to be test, test, test in test, QA, QA, QA in QA, prod, prod, prod in prod, and then uh, repo, repo, repo in the repo. So to be actually show it to you, I'm just doing a quick check on does it equal test, test, test if it does write out test. It's the only way I can show you the sequence are different based on which environment I'm in. But in all of them, I'm just accessing sequence.greeting. In QA, sequence.greeting in no particular environment, secrets.greeting, and then finally in environment prod, secrets.greeting. But notice I'm checking for prod, prod, prod in that one, repo, repo, repo in that one, QA, QA. So they should have different values depending on which environment they're running on. So that's kind of the key point of what we actually have here. So from this point, if I kind of look at my, my workflow here, this right here, um, I can actually go and view my runs. And I'll just, let's actually notice it's got this update, it's waiting. I'm just gonna, um, uh, it would have timed out. So I'm just gonna run the workflow. So let's run it now on main. And what we'll actually get is that same kind of graphical view. 
So here's my workflow. And notice, hey look, it's job one is gonna run first, then it will run job two, then it run job three and job four. Job four and job three are gonna run kind of at the same time. Now, the reason they can run at the same time is if we actually just jump back out for a second. If I look at job four, notice job four needs job two. Job three needs job two. So as soon as job two finishes, those other ones can actually run. Job two needs job one. So I can define the relationships actually between them. So that's how those are running. So we go and view the runs. So we can see QA is waiting. Remember I had a one minute timer. So job one is executed. Job two is waiting for that one minute timer that I actually defined in there. So now the wait is finished. So that job will now kick off. So job two will execute. If we look at job one, notice it outputted test. So the secret equaled test, test, test. It used the environment's variable, not the general repo one. Go back to the summary. So now job two is finished, which is running on QA and it outputted QA. Job three is also finished. No specific environment, so it outputted repo. Job four, that's way weird. Oh, it's waiting for review because I had reviewers for the environment. And it's even telling me, it would have sent me an email requesting your review. So I can review deployments. I can say either of these two people, me or Clark. I'll say, yep, um, manual test done, looks good. Approve and deploy. So now I approved it, that job will actually go ahead and start. So that's prod. If we look at prod, it outputted prod because that environment secret was used, not the repo general one. So the environments are giving us actually some, some nice things there. And actually just, to, can I show this? Let's have a quick look. So if I go back, um, if I view the workflow runs to try and show you me trying to test this initially. So let's have a look. Yeah, so look, I originally I just tried to echo out the secret where it protects you from your own stupidity. It's like you probably really don't mean to output that secret um, to your log file. So anytime it sees a secret, it will just put three asterisks there for you. So it protects you from yourself. So that's by design. It's like you're being an idiot. You probably don't want it to see in your log file. So it will give you some protection from yourself there. Another nice thing you can do is matrix. So imagine I wanted to build across three different versions of Node or across three different operating systems. Instead of having to do unique jobs for each of them, what I've done here is you can see I'm creating a strategy of matrix. And my matrix is called OS, and I've put three different values. So what I'm now saying is for this job, I want it to run on the matrix. So even though I only have one job defined here, and I just have these very simple steps of say hello, and I'm outputting the particular OS name of this step, it will actually create three jobs. So if I go to this, so I can see I've run it multiple times. If I just look at this, and, oh no, we're messing this up, sorry. Let's do this one more time. Go to my OS, I'm just gonna run it. So I can see the execution there, but we'll run it just for fun. And refresh, so there we go. What we'll see is zero of three jobs. So because of that matrix, and notice it says message Ubuntu latest, Windows latest, Mac OS latest. So it knows, hey, because of the matrix, I'm actually gonna do three things. 
So Ubuntu latest there. Windows latest here. And Mac OS latest. So it created three different runners, one for each of the operating systems, and ran it on all of them. Now you kind of see how quickly um, that actually runs. And Azure DevOps can do the same matrix thing as well. The reason it runs so quickly is, although it's an ephemeral VM, it, it has one sitting there waiting that are blank ready for you. So you're not actually waiting for it to go and actually create the VM in whatever that cloud is. It has some waiting, which is why it's a lot quicker than it would normally take to actually create a new virtual machine. So that's really the power of the environments and having those on the environment, the reviewers, the wait timers, the branch protection, those environmental secrets are super useful because I might have different um, keys, different credentials to talk to QA or staging or prod in Azure or AWS or whatever that might be. So that's a really powerful capability. But hopefully you, you see the kind of commonality between this evolution of the functionality we have. Now, as I, as I kind of talked about, from a billing perspective, you get a certain number of minutes. If it's a public repo, I think it's just free. Now, it's free and unlimited, but they are looking. If you try and create a, a job that's doing crypto mining, they're going to see that and kill it off. So don't do that. You ruin it for everyone. Um, I talked about kind of the packages you create. So we'll talk about that more in a future class. But these kind of registries, so Azure DevOps obviously has the concept of artifacts. For GitHub, you have the concept of packages. So if we jumped over for a second, in my code, we actually have over here on the, the right-hand side, packages. Now today in GitHub, packages are really repo-specific. It's not super easy to kind of share between repos, have kind of this enterprise level. There are org level packages. There is the ability for containers now to have better control on who can see it, who can use it. And I think that container model that they have at the org will kind of flow through to other types of package over time. But you can see, hey, if I do have those different dependencies, rather than using some public NPM or NuGet or Maven, I would pull it into my package management so I have a specific version. I only want those used. Maybe I've done security checks against them. And that's what I could then actually leverage. So it helps me kind of have that great control. And obviously, I can push my own things there as well that I then go and use. So that was kind of the, the high level thing. And that's the CICD. I mean, lots of moving parts, but it really fundamentally boils down to the idea that, hey, I have code going into my repo as my team. We're constantly bringing our code together. I want to make sure it's still good. And so continuous integration does the build, does some basic testing, it creates some artifact. And then to get that confidence, it's ready for delivery. Hey, we kick off continuous delivery. We make sure we consistently build the environment in a production consistent state. Remember, that's infrastructure as code. It might be I've changed the environment, in which case I might kick off a CD based on a certain type of commit on environment. I don't have to rebuild anything because I'm not changing source code but I would rebuild the environments. And I want to stage out and test, hey, an environmental size change or type of resource. I want to test that as well. Then we have consistent deployment of the same package to all environments. We have great testing across all the different areas. And then from a technology perspective, Azure DevOps has really evolved from this GUI with separate build release to just YAML pipelines with multiple stages using environments to GitHub Actions, multiple jobs that can have dependencies between other jobs. So I have that staging environments with different types of reviewers and wait timers. There is an API approval that I can use to expand that. But I'm using these very well-defined actions that those reusable units of code to use my CI and my CD. So that's, uh, that, that's it for this particular part of the class. Uh, as always, I hope this was useful. As always, there's a huge amount of work goes into preparing for these. So I really do appreciate kind of a like and subscribe. But uh, yeah, all the, the samples of this are in the repo in the description. And until next time, take care.